Hi, uh, I'm Hillary. When I told my dad I was presenting at this conference, he told me I should be fine and not worry since I've operated in crisis my entire life. Um, so I'm gonna talk about gender and Ebola and outbreak response. Why is gender important in the way in which we respond to disasters and disease? Um, well, in particular in West Africa and the countries of Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, there's a number of factors that impact on the way in which women are able to access and engage with services. Uh, maternal mortality, for example, in the country of C uh, Liberia is 710 deaths per 100,000 live births. In the United States, that's 23. So it's kind of an indicator for you to understand how both social and environmental and health factors impact on people's ability to access and respond to services. In addition, women are primary caregivers in a lot of these countries. So they are the ones who are on the front lines. Most of the nurses in these countries are female. Um, when husbands fall sick, they're caring, the wives are caring for them. When their children are sick, they're caring for them. So with a disease like Ebola, where it's transmitted through fluids and body and a deceased person and uh, feces, you know, you have this situation situation where people very, very much aren't able to care for in a traditional way with the people that they would. Um, and so we're seeing this dramatic spike in increase in disease very, very quickly uh, in the countries. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that women aren't included in the outset in the way in which you care for and you provide services to those that are ill. And so this outbreak, we've seen a much wider impact than in previous ones. Part of that has to do with urban infrastructure. Um, in these countries, access to sanitation is at 30% in most urban areas. Uh, in the rural areas, it's down in the teens. So this impacts a great deal on how um, people are able to care for those who are sick. And in previous outbreaks, we've seen that they're more localized in smaller villages outside of major cities. So this is the first time we've really seen dense impacts in major, major urban areas. Um, so as you can see, I have a number of maps up here, and one of the problems with trying to understand how gender impacts on this from a geography perspective is that there's not a lot of disaggregated data. And so it's collected, but for example in Liberia, um, of the, you know, this is where the, the most transmission in cases are, they have something upward of 4,000 confirmed cases, they only have actual gender information on about 100 of them. And so, as you can see with uh, Sierra Leone here, 6% more women are being affected by the disease than men. Um, and what this means is that not only are, are, are women having higher rates of transmission, but they're also going to be the ones that are caring again more. And so it becomes difficult in a response if you're not willing to account for some of these unique issues. And it is very difficult. People don't want to talk about gender. It's one of those ancillary issues that cross cuts across you know, broad sections of your response. But it's very important to incorporate that while you're designing your interventions, because if you don't account for it, you will see as you have in life Liberia, dramatic spikes very quickly. Um, part of that is lack of reporting, part of that is you know, infrastructure issues, but a significant part of that is the way in which we include the people that are on the front lines in providing these services. And for the most part, and for example, Liberia Monastrat, where the transmission rate in, is very, very high, you have a high density of urban impoverished females. Um, you have them working as traders. They are the primary agricultural producers in these countries. So you're having very uh, a number of combined effects in the way in which this is affecting livelihoods across the region. And so, again, one of the primary issues with this disease is that it really kind of challenges your humanity in that when your daughter is sick, you want to care for her. You want to be able to touch her. You want to be able to, you know, clean her up and put her to bed. And you can't do that in this case. And so it very much affects the way in which we are able to, as humans, care for one another. And so what are some of the ways in which organizations are using innovative approaches to address this. Well, um, there's a group that has been training young girls in Liberia to do community outreach, which is very interesting because you're empowering a group of individuals who typically aren't on the front lines of response. They have lower rates of enrollment in primary education than boys. They are more likely to um, get pregnant and drop out of school. Um, they're married very young, things like this. And so it's really important that when you also have a higher rate of disease among women, you're also likely going to have higher survivorship among women. So this means including your survivors in your response. And so there's a lot of really innovative ways that UNICEF and MSF and uh, different organizations have been trying to address some of these gaps. And I think that's really important because it's something that we haven't seen in previous outbreaks, even though it was very clear that women were dying at higher rates than men. We knew this in DRC, we knew this in Uganda, you know, this is not 
something new to us. So one of the really important things is using radio and, and very innovative outreach strategies to reach your population and provide them with this information because literacy is low. So the way in which we really engage with people is really important in how we respond. So thank you. <laughs>